Uh, can you share your screen? Recording in progress. Yes. Can you hear me? Oh. Yes, perfectly. But I, I do not see your screen. Uh, yeah, now I'm seeing. Thanks. Yep. Okay. <clears throat> Great. So um, basically, I'm going to try and present to you a very, very biased review of what I think are the most pressing questions in uh, planetary nebula research and a little bit of background information to give you context. If I don't present your work or something related to your work, I'm sorry. It's not because I don't find it interesting. It's uh, in at the risk of sounding like a, a terrible defense secretary. There are things that I know we don't know, but there are also things that I don't know that we don't know. So those I don't discuss. <clears throat> so straight into it. Firstly, uh, nebular abundances. So abundances of uh, ionized nebulae can be calculated using emission lines from the same chemical species, but um, excited by a different mechanisms. So here in this plot, for example, I show you a spectrum of a planetary nebula where there is um, emission from doubly ionized oxygen in collisionally excited lines at 5,007 angstroms and 4959 angstroms, as well as recombination line emission at around uh, 4,640. And you can see that these uh, the fluxes between these two lines are massively different. And the uh, collision excited lines are always much, much brighter. So in most cases, we measure the abundances only using those collisionally excited lines, uh, particularly if the, we're talking about abundances in, uh, in external galaxies, for example. But if we compare the abundances in both planetary nebulae and H2 regions, derived for the, chem so the same chemical species, but using lines with different excitation mechanisms, we always get different abundances. The abundances from the very faint recombination lines are always, apart from in one case or two cases, brighter than the abundances from collisionally excited lines. And in particular, if we look at this distribution, there is a, a sort of median discrepancy, so the ratio between these two, of about two. But there's a, a tail that extends off to values of uh, 10 to the three almost. And in this very extended tail of high abundance discrepancies, so high ratios between the, the recombination line abundances and the collision excited line abundances, is where we find predominantly planetary nebulae with very close binary central stars. Clearly, binarity cannot be the cause of all of these abundance discrepancies because H2 regions are not all formed, are not all around binaries. But there's clearly something at work in these, which has a binary origin, presumably, which is driving these very high abundance discrepancies. And unlocking the key to this entire distribution really is a, a critical question because if we can only measure collisionally excited line abundances for the majority of ionized nebulae, and we use those to probe the chemical abundances of galaxies, are we really measuring the right abundances? <clears throat> so focusing on these um, high abundance discrepancy, extreme abundance discrepancy nebulae, if we look at the distribution of the emission in these two different emission lines, uh, emission lines from the same chemical species, but, uh, from recombination lines and collision excited lines, they're not coincident. They're not spatially coincident. The recombination lines are generally centrally concentrated. So again, this might be hinting towards some binary evolutionary origin. And uh, it seems to imply that um, there is a, a metal rich component to these nebulae, which is centrally concentrated. And uh, because it's metal rich, it's more effectively cooled. And so predominantly emits in the recombination lines rather than in the collision excited lines. <clears throat> so for the, the Abundance discrepancy in general, there are a number of explanations uh, from temperature distributions through to, through to these chemical inhomogeneities. But it seems as though, at least for the very high abundance discrepancies, there are chemical inhomogeneities that are related to the binary evolution of the central star. But how? <clears throat> Next problem, the planetary nebula luminosity function. For those of you that are not familiar with it, if you look at the cumulative distribution of the brightnesses of planetary nebula in any population, old, young, high metallicity, low metallicity, 
the brightest planetary nebulae always sit at approximately, there's a slight dependence on metallicity, but always sit at roughly the same uh, magnitude in the emission line, in the 5007 oxygen-3 emission line. And so you can use this as a standard candle to determine the distances to, to galaxies, at least within the local group, just by imaging these galaxies in, in oxygen-3 and looking for the brightest planetary nebulae there and checking that uh, checking the magnitude and comparing it to this to this bright cutoff but there's no good physical explanation for why this should be the case <clears throat> so some recent work has indicated that at least using the the recent evolutionary tracks of, of marcello that perhaps we can begin to understand why this is true the case in almost all populations because previously uh, this very high luminosity in the in the oxygen three line implied very very high mass um, progenitors, two and a half three solar mass progenitors, which clearly don't uh, aren't around in all populations. If you're an old elliptical galaxy, these stars have already disappeared. But with uh, Marcello's tracks, this seemed to have been resolved a little bit with uh, the mass required. Uh, revised down to something between one or two solar masses. But then recent studies um, of specific planetary nebulae in M31 showed that uh, self-extinction, which is very difficult to take into account using this uh, simple imaging of, 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 uh, of galaxies, uh, really you need spectroscopy to do this, indicates that if you don't take that into account, the bright cutoff could actually be uh, almost a magnitude brighter than, than what we think. And that reinstates the problem, puts the, the required mass up at 2.5 solar masses again. So there's a possibility that maybe this is driven by binarity and mergers of lower mass stars to produce higher mass stars, even in, in old populations. But even that has a, a significant issues because how do you keep the steady supply of, uh, intermediate, of low mass stars merging? Another potential uh, resolution is that the what we think the initial final mass relation is isn't quite right and in fact the lower mass progenitors can produce high mass remnants and these high mass remnants are very luminous and can uh, can lead to this um, this bright cutoff so is the initial final mass relation kinky does it have this big peak in the in this one to two solar mass range so I've already mentioned binaries uh, a number of times. So a little bit of justification. If we take all likely or theoretically um, eligible stars to that will produce planetary nebulae, so stars in the mass range of, say, one to eight solar masses, about 50% of all those stars have binary companions. That's a lot. We can't ignore that. We can't assume that this is a single star phenomenon. But... How many of those are close enough that it's going to have an impact on their evolution? Well, at least 20% of binaries, so 10% of all that population, will be close enough to uh, undergo Roche lobe overflow. What happens in the Roche lobe overflow? It depends on the parameters of the system, but it means at least 10% of all of these uh, PN progenitors are close enough to significantly impact their, their evolution. And rather than going to much more detail on the on the common envelope i'll refer you to the talks by emily wilson and the talk tomorrow by gila glanz <clears throat> so if we take this 10 percent fraction of main sequence stars that should form planetary nebulae that's very difficult to uh, to make fit with the observed fraction of close binaries inside planetary nebulae which is at, at least 20 percent so the photometrically detectable close binary fraction. So this will miss anything that's uh, quite wide, but still post common envelope or low mass companions is 20%. So that's already double what you might expect just from the simple uh, main sequence distribution. And that's ignoring the fact that some of those 10% would merge in the common envelope phase. And so they wouldn't survive as binaries. So that raises the question if we would expect 10% and we've already got 
if we would expect the maximum of 10%, we've already got a minimum of 20. Does this mean that planetary nebulae form preferentially via binary interactions? Does it mean that there's a significant population of those one to eight solar mass stars that we think should form a planetary nebulae that don't? There's an indication that maybe if we look at the statistics, something like only one sixth of all of those stars end up forming a planetary nebula. If we use other techniques to measure the binary fraction in planetary nebulae, which is sensitive to longer period systems, so it's not just these, these um, very tight binaries where there will have been definite interaction, then you can get um, a fraction as high as 80%, which is quite attractive because that's more or less the same fraction of planetary nebulae that are aspherical. So these bi the binary uh, gives you a clear route to, to impact the morphology. But these are very susceptible to some uh, to problems with the um, with the analysis. So that 80% has to be taken with a pinch of salt and has very large uncertainties. In any case, uh, in a very nice paper from Walter Riedman last year, they looked at a compilation of uh, planetary nebula central stars from the literature and compared them to Marcello's evolutionary tracks and found that 50% of them fit with these single star evolutionary tracks, but 50% of them don't. So maybe that's an indication that these 50% that don't lie on those evolutionary tracks have experienced a different evolution, a binary evolution. <clears throat> and to justify this, because I, there's a, a popular misconception, I think, in the planetary Three nebula community minutes. at Sorry. least. Sorry? Sorry, Marcelo? Three more minutes from now. Okay. Okay, well, I have to speed up. Uh, there's a <clears throat> misconception that really binarity is only about explaining the morphologies, but binarity has a very important impact on nucleosynthesis. It can cut short the nucleosynthesis of the star. It can alter their evolutionary tracks. The fact that it changes perhaps the ejector mass or even the density by changing the shape really can impact on the formation of molecules and dust perhaps even providing nucleation sites for, for second generation certain binary planets, if we want to stretch that far. So given I have so little time, I'm going to skip over this uh, and mention that amongst these known binary central stars, we find a lot that are in fact two white dwarfs, which should be both very difficult to detect and quite difficult to form. Uh, so the fact that we see an overabundance of these systems perhaps mean, and this is a very favorable phase in which to see them, once they're more evolved, they're more difficult to detect, perhaps indicates that our understanding of the formation of the systems is off. And so there might be a lot more of these out there to be detected. And that has implications for our understanding of the origins of type 1a supernovae, a standard candle worthy of a Nobel Prize, but for which we still don't understand their origins, one of which could be related to the merger of double degenerate stars. So studying PN can help. If I have time, I talk about pre-planetary nebulae. So we expect that these will evolve into planetary nebulae. And yet, while we have a hard lower limit of 20% of post-common envelope central stars in planetary nebulae, there are no confirmed post-common envelope central stars in pre-planetary nebulae. One example that people quote a lot, but um, uh, you can see the paper there that I mentioned as an explanation for why this is probably speculative for now, and people have really searched for these things. Bruce Krivnak has really looked, spent a lot of time searching for these things and hasn't found any. There are a handful of white binaries, but uh, no post-common envelope. So what's going on there? Uh, Tomek Kaminsky has shown that the properties of pre-planetary nebula are quite similar to luminous red novae, which are merger products. So could that mean that these um, pre-planetary nebula actually merges in the common envelope rather than surviving common envelope binaries? And therefore, that the common envelope, post common envelope binaries that we see in planetary nebulae pass by the pre planetary phase too quickly or don't experience a pre planetary phase that we would uh, see. You have one more and, minute. And, okay, okay, sure. And similarly, what about the disky post AGB, post RGB binaries that uh, Hans von Winkle and Devika Kamath have been finding that seem to be able to bypass entirely the planetary nebula phase? These are binaries, so they don't go to form the 20% of, no, of post-common envelope binaries in planetary nebulae, but they managed, they should have been planetary nebula progenitors, but they don't form planetary nebulae. So to end on time, I hope, my big questions, 
the PNLF, which are the bright PNE at the in the Blanchard Nebula luminosity function? Are they the most massive? Are they one solar mass? Are they binaries? Why are they there? Why can't we find any binaries in pre-planetary nebulae? Why do we seem to find so many in planetary nebulae? And what is their true impact on the evolution of the system? Why are so many of them double degenerates? And what can that tell us about the formation of other post-common envelope phenomena like type 1a supernovae? And for both of, for more general information for both of those, I refer you to the, the book that I wrote with Henri Boffin a couple of years ago, and also to the, this YouTube link for a much longer talk than I could present here. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much.